So where did you go to first to look? Was it the kind of patristic sources? Was it the biblical evidence, historical evidence? So um, the first thing that I did was I wanted to I wanted to have a way of categorizing and putting all of the evidence into like a worksheet or a document that I could like say, okay, yeah, here's this piece of data, here's this piece of data, all of this speaks to the papacy. I don't want to leave anything out. I, I love this. Could you just yeah. give us like an overview of what you mean by this? Because you were on my show with Dr. Scott Hahn. People should go check that video out because at that point you still weren't convinced of the papacy and it was great to have Scott there. But you actually, so I would like you to talk about this. You, yeah. you created a spreadsheet. A spreadsheet. I mean, I love that even Scott was impressed by that. And Scott <laughs> is a nerd of the most beautiful variety, yeah. right? And yeah. so the fact that he was impressed with that and then you assigned what? Points to each line of evidence for so, and against? So what I did was I, I created a, what, what I call a Bayesian like analysis of the, all of the evidence for and against the papacy. And so I, I use the Bayesian framework because I think that it's a more formal way of doing like everyday probabilistic calculations that you do on your, in your own, like on, in your head. And you're like, okay, how likely is this event? And you'll say, oh, it's really likely. That might be some, you know, some example that you would just come up with. But uh, in, in Bayesian terms, like what you'll do is you'll assign a figure to that probability and right. so you can be a little bit more precise mm. in seeing like okay well how much of an effect probabilistically does this piece of evidence actually have as opposed to just going on the sort of more informal okay this is some evidence here's yeah. some evidence here's some evidence here's a lot of evidence here's a lot of evidence how but many then you know but then you don't really know at, at the end of that how it all combines how many lines of evidence did you have for and against the papacy roughly there weren't a lot for the papacy there was the biblical ah. there, there were the biblical arguments i see and but there's a lot of protestant objections there's a lot of pieces of data that protestants will say so i i, I would say I, like count counting them up i probably had like four for the papacy and about 15 wow. against the papacy and and it seems to me that what's interesting about this analysis is that <clears throat> rather than going on your kind of intuition yeah you're, you're, you actually don't know what the evidence is going to show yeah, you because yeah. you're going through them one by one and assigning a number. Yeah, and so what I did at the beginning was I wanted to be charitable to both sides. Again, I'm trying to fight my bias. So I'm trying to be charitable to the Catholics. I'm also trying to be charitable to the Protestants. And so what I would do is I would assign a charitable number to each of the, the pieces of data and be like, okay, well, yeah, how likely is this? Eh. Like, let's give the Protestant something here. And so we'll give him a little, like, this is a little bit of evidence against the papacy. Can't really say that's a whole lot, but this is still being charitable. And so, but what you can do with the, with the Protestant case is you can accumulate all of these different lines of evidence. So they've got the Didache, they've got these different documents, these early church documents, where you don't see, like, the papacy clearly laid out in specific names and everything. And so they'll say, this is a document we would expect mm -hmm. to find the papacy in this, in this, early, this early document. And so, and then, but there are obviously Catholics who want to respond to that, like Jimmy Akin, and be like, well, no, there's actually reason to suspect that they wouldn't have named sp specific names in the early church because why? The church was being persecuted. So you're not going to just spell out all the names of the most important figures in your religion so that people can just read the letter and then go hunt them down and, and kill them. And so there's, there's reasonable, like, responses to that but nevertheless I was still being charitable to the Protestants and giving it some some weight of evidence against you the would papacy. think if you have around 15 arguments against the papacy and only four yeah. in favor of the papacy that it's got to be hard for the papacy to come out on top unless those four arguments are very strong yeah so there's there's really three passages in the New Testament that are sort of relevant to the the papacy in terms of like giving some positive boost to it which is Matthew 16, John 21, and Luke 22. And you, if you look at those three, you'll see that, I mean, I think being charitably, you can say, okay, this does give a little bit of weight to the side of the papacy. But what really surprised me, and this is why I spent so much of my time focusing on this one piece of, of data, is there is this argument called the typological, uh, the, I, I, there's, there's all sorts of names for it, but the typological Eliakim argument, you may sure. call it something like that. But there's a connection, there's a textual illusion between Matthew 16, 19 and Isaiah 22, 22, which talks about the office of Eliakim. And it's a textual illusion back to this Old Testament character, Eliakim. And so the argument goes is that Peter, that's mentioned in Matthew 16, 19, 
is the fulfillment of Eliakim. Mm -hmm. So he is the new Eliakim. He's the type, that's the typological yes. argument, the connection between the Old Testament character, the, the New Testament character. And what you do then is you see that the office of the Old Testament office is going to be very similar in all sorts of ways to the New Testament office. Not, not in every way. Obviously, there's going to be, because the new, the, uh, Jesus' kingdom was greater than David's kingdom, there's going to be greater properties that are going to exist in the anti-type, the yes. The type that you see, yeah, the fulfillment that you see in the in the New Testament. So it's not going to be a one-to-one -one correspondence between the two, but you're nevertheless going to see some correspondence. And so if you look at what properties Eliakim's office had, then it was very close to the papal office. And so then the question is, does that really transfer over? Does that office transfer over to Peter? And so I was I was not convinced about this argument for a while. But what I saw was that. If this argument is true, and again, I was trying to be charitable to both sides. If this argument is true, it is so unlikely that Protestantism or Orthodoxy is true. Again, this is, this is the distinctive doctrine, is the papacy. And so basically it's like, if you've got Peter, he's got these papal-like qualities with his office being the new Eliakim. How likely is that on the papacy? seems pretty likely that we would find that in scripture. But then you flip it around if you're doing this Bayesian analysis. And then you ask, how likely is that data given something other than Catholicism, something other than the papacy, so like Protestantism or Orthodoxy? How likely is that data? And I just have to say, thinking about it charitably, again, it's got to be super, super low. It's got to be very, very low. I see. And so this, this is really strong evidence for, for the papacy if you're convinced of the typological I see. Argument. So if you're not, it doesn't do much damage. But if you are, it's very convincing. Is that what you're saying? Um, there's a caveat there. So I was going to wait to talk about that a little bit later. Let me, do you mind if I pull up my oh, notes course. and see if there's anything that I've missed? And just while you're doing that, just so for those who aren't aware, when we talk about typology, we're referring to persons, places, and events in the Old Testament. Um, that foreshadow a greater reality in the new. So St. Augustine says the New Testament is concealed in the old, the old is revealed in the new, and this is not some medieval invention. St. Paul talks about Christ as the new Adam, um, and there are many other examples. Yeah, yeah one of uh, a uh, Catholic philosopher I had on the channel recently said that Christianity is a typological religion. And this is one of the things that's really gave me, given me like a, a, a better appreciation for the Bible is the fact that the New Testament ties in mm. to the Old Testament. It's the fulfillment of the mm. Old Testament. It's not as if, I mean, as a Protestant, my, my view was kind of like, oh, we could kind of like get rid of the Old Testament. Like, let's forget about it. Let's try to forget about it. Because you have these problematic Old Testament passages about the Canaanites and bears attacking children. It's like, let's, can we just forget about the Old right. Testament? Can we just yeah. like forget about that and just focus on the New Testament because it's this all about is, love uh, and... The Marcion heresy, isn't it? It's not a new... Well, it's something that I was just sort of like drawn to, yeah. like, uh, you know, uh, unconsciously. Yep, yep, yep. I was like, I wish that I could just do away with the Old Testament. Yes. Because then it would just like... Solve, solve a lot of a issues, lot of especially issues. in your debates with atheists. It's like, yeah. gosh, we could just put yeah. that to one side. And yeah. I feel like it wouldn't be as embarrassing. Yeah. But I love that. Yeah, it's But then typology saw, uh, helped me see the importance of the Old Testament and how important it is for the New Testament authors, including Jesus. Jesus went through and Luke all the Old Testament scriptures and was like, yeah, this is, Moses had to do this and all that, and that's why I'm here. Yeah. And so it is it is a typological religion, Christianity. Would, so, would, would you mind if I pressed back against this, maybe try to play devil's advocate with this, or would you sure. rather me not do that? <laughs> um, well, I, I let me, do you mind if I just Please. continue the, the journey? So at this point, I did start to look into this one argument. So it, because I saw if this argument actually works, then it's really powerful evidence for mm -hmm. the papacy. And so then I wanted to actually study it and look into it a lot deeper. And so <clears throat> as I studied it, I continued to remain sort of agnostic about it. I continued to just see, I mean, yeah, like this argument, I, th there are good reasons to think that it's successful. Right. But then you hear objections from Gavin Ortland, like uh, typology run amok. Right. And you're like, 
that seems like a good objection. Yeah. I don't really know. Aren't what to you do just with reading that. into this? How yeah. is it? Yeah. How do you know that these properties transfer over? You don't know that. And so, I remained agnostic about it. And so I was, uh, but I was talking one day with a, a friend of mine who's an expert in in uh, Bayesian analysis. And I was like, so what do I do at this point? Do I do I just like ignore that piece of data? Or what do I do with it if I'm not convinced about this da this data being an actual data point? Do I ignore it and then just like go with whatever the other evidence that I've got? And he was like, no, you don't ignore it. What you do is you cut its probabilistic force in half. If you're unsure about mm. that piece of data, then you cut its probabilistic force in half. And so naturally I went directly to my document and I did that and the probability after I cut the the probability in half came out to 0.91, I think. It was, it was 0.90 or 0.91 that the papacy is true. And so that at that point, I was like, that was one of the first points where I was like, this could really be, this, this could be it. Like this, this could be the thing that really convinces me of. If that argument if, you know, didn't work, yeah. would the Bayesian analysis still lean in favor of the papacy? According that's to what, your yeah, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm saying is that it, it, that may be controversial. I, I got this from an expert in Bayes, sure. so I don't know if that's like a controversial move or, or what, but this is what I was, you know, on the, on the basis of talking okay. with one of the world's foremost experts on it, this is something that you can do. What's up? I'm just moving this. Uh, no worries. Yeah. No worries. Everyone thinks that the, uh, your audio is off, but it's okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, yeah, no, my audio is not off. I have yeah. a microphone. Um, so yeah, so what this is saying is that you can still have the argument play some some level, give some level uh, of support, play have some evidential uh, force, even yeah. if you're not convinced of it. Because if you deny the argument, yeah, that's not an argument in favor against the papacy. Right, because this is an argument for it. So yeah. if you just deny it, then you would just do away with it. I so see. if you so if you do have reasons, I, and again, I was in the position of, I see good arguments on both sides. There's good arguments that people have given. Uh, like so on sauna that you know Peter's office will have these papal like qualities and then I see arguments from Gavin Ortland and, and I, I see that side too and so there's like these equal supports that I can see on both sides of it so I was kind of like teetering in the middle and so that's where I was now if if maybe what you're saying suggesting is if you were convinced that Gavin is right that Peter's office doesn't have these papal like qualities then yeah it's not going to do much work for you Right. But I was at the point where I was like even on it. So see, yeah. if you're at that point, if you're sort of, if you can see both sides, like I was being, being the case, then uh, it can have some evidential force. And, and it can indeed have a lot because of how unexpected that data is, again, given uh, what we call in, in the Bayes, we call it the negation. So the negation of the papacy hypothesis. When was it that you saw that then? Um, and kind of concluded the analysis. That was that was probably about a. I want to say it's hard to it's hard to know the exact timeline of that, but I would say it was probably a, a couple of few months before I decided to actually convert. So okay. I, so th there's still more time between yes. those, those two points. So what happened in between those two points? So um, in between those two points, I continued to uh, to study the argument, and so I I, I continued to look into it. But then I really started to consider, because I, be, because I saw this move that can be made in the, in when you do a sort of Bayesian analysis and when you're, you're convinced, equally convinced of both sides of a, of a piece of data like this. Very unique situation. And then I really started to think like, okay, wh okay what, what would actually happen if I were to just like follow this evidence? Like what would actually be the case for me? What, how would this change me, my ministry, my relationship with my wife? Mm. And so I had to like, I had to really think about that. And so I, I decided I'm gonna put the brakes on it. Like I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna chill out for this on a while. Yeah. And just really sit down and, and consider everything. And so I, I slowed down. I really took my time with the argument. And I also wanted to look into Eastern Orthodoxy, see what the what it was like over there. And so I, I had I, I only had one Eastern Orthodox on the channel. And so the reason for that is I had a, an Eastern Orthodox to, to come on and, and share his story because he converted to Eastern Orthodoxy from Protestantism. 
And, uh, well, I think he came all the way from agnosticism. But um, I eventually, I, I got in touch with Michael Lofton, and Michael Lofton has gone through this whole journey as, where, as yeah. well, where he went from Protestant to Catholic to Eastern Orthodox back to Catholic. And uh, I think I got in contact with him one day, and I was like, hey, you know, what do you think about Eastern Orthodoxy? And he was like, immediately his first answer was the papacy. And I was like, no, duh, that's what I've been <laughs> studying this whole time. And so it just kind of reconfirmed mm. to me that it just comes down to whether or not there's good reasons for the papacy being true. Yeah, big shout out to Michael Lofton. He's, he's doing a lot of great work. I'd recommend everyone go subscribe to his channel, Reason and Theology. Yeah, and so it just reconfirmed for me that I need to focus in on that piece of data, the Lyakim typological argument. Hey, thanks for watching. Before you go, I want you to go and download the best Catholic app in the universe. Hello, H-A-L-L-O-W dot com slash Matt. Why am I saying slash Matt? Because if you go to the website and download it there, click the link in the description below, you can try the app, the full app out for three months. If you don't like it, cancel. You won't be charged a dime. It's a very reasonable monthly rate. But as I say, you won't get charged for the first three months. Please go check them out. They've got excellent things over there like sleep stories and litanies and novenas and audio books. It's all very professionally done and I'd highly recommend it. Hello.com slash Matt. That's, and I'm just double checking. Hello.com slash Matt. Link in the description. <laughs>